Well, good evening and welcome to Cleveland Baptist Church. I'd like to encourage you to find a seat and we're going to get started here with a word of prayer. I'd like to ask you to, uh, to remind you to silence your cell phones as we get ready for this uh, very special service. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us. Lord, we thank you for this time of the year where our hearts are focused upon you and only you. And God, that's our desire tonight, Lord, that we would consider the suffering of Christ, Lord, the great payment that was made for our salvation. Father, we pray that you'd cleanse us tonight. Lord, we ask, God, that you'd meet with us in a very special way. We pray that everything that's said and done is done for your honor and your glory. God, we ask you to give us a great night tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This service is in remembrance of Christ's suffering. The Apostle Paul gave instructions to the church at Corinth, just as Jesus gave instructions to his church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and 24 and 25, where the Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you to turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter number 53. The Apostle Paul is calling the church at Corinth to remember. So tonight we, like the disciples and like those New Testament churches before us, we enter into this solemn service in remembrance of Christ. We remember the night when the angels heralded his birth to shepherds in the fields outside of Bethlehem. We remember the night when we, went, we, we uh, remember the story of a vibrant and eager young boy sitting with the doctors at the temple, both hearing them and asking them questions to their amazement. We remember the compassion that Christ had as he miraculously fed fi uh, thousands with, with loaves of bread and a few fishes. We remember his compassion as he healed the leper, gave sight to the blind, and healed the lame. We remember his tender love and care as he showed to his close friends and his followers alike as he literally poured his life into them. We remember with great power and authority how he calmed the raging sea of Galilee and confronted the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. We remember that awesome display of his powerful words in the Garden of Gethsemane as soldiers fell on the down to the ground when he told them, I am he. We remember tonight, but this is not what he calls us to remember on this night. No, this night, like that night in the upper room and every time that his table has been biblically observed since then, we are called to remember his suffering. We'll begin our reading tonight in Isaiah chapter 53. We'll do a responsive reading. I'll read the first verse, the odd verses of the chapter, and you'll read in unison the even verses. And I would encourage you to take your time to pause at the punctuation and stay together as best you can as a group. As we read this, I'll read verse number one, you'll read verse number two, I'll read verse number three, and so on throughout the chapter, you'll be reading the even verses. The Bible says here in Isaiah chapter 53, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was saved.
And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. I invite you to turn your Bible to John chapter number 19. First portion of scripture we consider the suffering was foretold hundreds of years earlier. Here we see in the gospel of John the suffering is fulfilled. Look with me as I read in John chapter 19 verse number 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers played the crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Look down to verse number 17 and 18. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with two other with him on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Look down at verse number 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and they saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Christ's suffering was fulfilled. Tonight we remember his suffering was for our salvation. Turn with me in Philippians chapter number 2. We'll conclude our reading here in Philippians chapter number 2. The Bible says in verse number five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I'd invite you to stand at this time, please, and we'll sing hymn number 168 together. When I survey the wondrous cross, hymn number 168. I'll come together on that first. When I survey the
hymn number 159, the Lamb of Glory, hymn number 159. On that first verse, hear the story from God's Word. Hear the story from God's Word that He like for us to learn a new hymn this evening as we think about this night and what we're set here to do and really the title of this song is called gaze on the christ i'll sing this first verse and chorus for us to help us learn this tune this tune behold the lamb the spotless lamb who takes away our sin Behold the Lamb, the spotless Lamb, who takes away our sin. The debt we faced was not erased, but paid in full by Him. Gaze on the Christ, our sacrifice, an altar made of wood. Exalt the Lamb, the worthy Lamb, who bought us with His blood. Now let's join together on this first verse together now. Behold the Lamb, the spotless Lamb, who takes away our sin, the debt we face. Okay. 
Behold the Lamb, the risen Lamb. Behold the Lamb, the risen Lamb, who takes away destiny. All knees shall bend, all praise ascend to Christ the living King. Gaze on the cross, our sacrifice on altar made. If you have your Bibles this evening, we'll take them and we'll go to the book of Exodus, chapter number 12, please. The 12th chapter in the book of Exodus, the second book of our Old Testament. I suppose maybe in some respects, maybe a, a little bit of an unusual place for us to be on a night like tonight, but I think by the time we're done, it'll make some sense as to why we're here. Exodus chapter number 12. I want to begin reading in verse number one. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. In the evening, they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The next few moments, I'd like for us to think about the Passover and really how it compares to the Lord's Supper table really what Jesus Christ did for us. The Israelites had been in Egypt for more than 400 years. Most of you are quite familiar with that. Much of that time had been spent in bondage. Exodus chapter number 2 and verse number 23 reveals that their bondage was wearisome and, and that they cried out or groaned unto God uh, for relief. And God heard their groaning and, and he looked upon his people favorably. God sent a man by the name of Moses to deliver his people from Egyptian bondage. And over a, over a period of time, God poured out his wrath and judgment on the nation of Egypt through plagues. Plagues that were designed to make life and living in the land of Egypt quite uncomfortable. Nine plagues had been delivered so far, and yet Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. The tenth plague that God was preparing to send that is alluded to here in our text would would bring about Israel's deliverance and freedom from bondage. 
God instructed his people here in our text to take, to take or secure a lamb for each and every house. If a house was too small, if, if there were too few people in it for them to, to take one lamb just for them, they were, they were permitted to join with a neighbor in this particular exercise. The lamb, the Bible says, was to be killed on the 14th day of the month, and its blood was to be applied to the outside doorposts of their home. They were to eat the flesh the same night they killed it and the same night in which they applied the blood. God promised that on this night he would pass through Egypt and slay all the firstborn in the land. He assured his people that if he saw the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their house, he would pass over them and they would be spared from death and destruction. Israel simply had to believe and obey the instructions God gave them through Moses and Aaron. That's all they had to do. Believe, trust, and obey. God gave, God gave us his son, Jesus Christ, and when he began his public ministry, he was heralded by John the Baptist in John chapter 1 and verse number 29 as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The lambs in Exodus chapter number 12, no doubt in my mind, were a picture of a coming lamb who would shed his blood, not just for the sins of one house, not just the sins of one house in Israel or perhaps a couple of houses that came together because they were too little for, for one lamb. No, the lamb of God would shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. This week is significant for us as believers because it was this week in which Christ satisfied the wrath of God once and for all as God's Passover lamb. It is very likely, as I think about the timeline, in my mind it is very likely, I wouldn't argue with people about this, but to me it is likely that it was on this very night, Wednesday, that Christ gathered with his closest followers in the upper room. And it was there he instituted, as God had instituted in the Old Testament, he instituted a supper that we will observe as a church family tonight. You know, I got to thinking about this idea of this Lord's Supper, and, 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 I, and I was reminded that God has always designed ways for his people to visibly demonstrate their faith. That's very, that's very important to, to God, and therefore it should be very important to us as well. In other words, you, you as people of faith, if you consider yourself a man or a woman or a young person of faith tonight, no one, no one can see the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of you in a literal form. And so God has designed various ways for us to visibly manifest or visibly demonstrate who we are on the inside. You could turn around and you could look behind me and you could see and in this church, just like many other churches, there is a, a little pool of water. That's one of the ways through baptism that God has designed for us to demonstrate or to visibly manifest uh, our faith in an outward way. In much the same way, we gather tonight at this, at this Lord's Supper table, and as you, as you in just a few moments will take hold of the little piece of bread that is provided, and as you take hold of the, the cup that is, is given to you, and as you ingest those things, as you take those things into your body, you are, you are telling everyone around you that you are a believer, that you are a man or a woman of faith. So it's a, it's a literal way or a, 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 a visible way that we can demonstrate or manifest our, uh, our faith. I, I think to myself, there's other ways that we can do that. We can do that by living holy lives. We can do that by going out in our communities and proclaiming the gospel. We can do that by faithfulness in, in church, by, by being here. This is a way that you can tell people, that you can proclaim to people, hey, I'm a believer and I'm not ashamed of it. Now, can I say that on the night of the Passover, people of faith in God were distinguished visibly. They were distinguished visibly by the fact that blood, literal blood, was applied to the doorposts of their homes. 
I don't know exactly how this all played out. I'm, I'm given to, to understand as I read my Bible that the nation of Israel was sort of sequestered in a, in a portion of Egypt that maybe, maybe the, the normal Egyptians didn't, you know, didn't, didn't travel to all that often except for those that maybe had some responsibilities to keep the, the Israelites in line. But, but I'm, just, I'm just imagining for a moment that maybe an Egyptian family was walking down a street that was populated by Hebrews and they're, and they're watching as, 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 they're, as they're taking these little basins and, and, and they take something, they, they, they dip it in that basin and they begin to apply it to the doorposts of their home on, on both sides and then across the top. And as they look a little closer, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a dark reddish color and they, and, and they realize what they're doing. They're applying blood actual blood, lamb's blood, to the doorposts of their home. They probably thought, that's a little strange. It's a little odd that they would do such a thing. I've often thought that if you were an unbeliever, you came into a service like this, and you sat and you didn't know anything about who we are, what the Bible prescribes, what the Bible uh, tells us to do as believers, and, and you sat in a service like this, and you watched someone get into a pool of water, and this was completely foreign to you, and, and they acknowledged that they were a believer in Christ, and they were dipped in that water, plunged in that water, brought back up, and they went, up, went upstairs, up the stairs, and that, and that was it. You would think, that's strange. It's odd, isn't it? And I thought, you know, you come to a service like this, and this is completely foreign. Again, we're, 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 taking, we're taking for granted the fact that we've grown up in a Christian nation, and so you could turn on a television program, perhaps, and watch a church so service being, being, being you know, portrayed, and, and you could see a baptism, maybe even see a, a Lord's Supper service, but this was completely foreign to you. And, and, and you watched as a plate was passed down the aisle, and, and everyone reached into that plate and grabbed a little, a little piece of bread, and, and, and then another plate was passed down. Everybody grabbed a little cup of juice, and, and, and you, saw, you thought, what are these people doing? This is, this is strange. No, no, more, no stranger than, than, than an Egyptian walking down the streets of uh, where the Israelites lived and watching them as that 14th day of that first month that was to be the first month of the year for them, watching as they dipped the hyssop there in the basin and they applied blood to the doorpost of their house. You think, what are those people doing? Strange. Uh, that's a little weird. Tonight, can I say tonight, people of faith can be, in this, in this service, they can be distinguished by their participation in this supper. In other words, as you, as you participate in this supper, as you take the bread and as you take hold of that little cup of juice and as you, as you take those things into your body, you, you will proclaim, you will proclaim to people that you are a man, you are a woman of faith. Some might think, that, some might think, well, then I, I can come to this supper as a lost man, or, or perhaps I can come as a back, in a backslidden condition, and I can fool all those around me, and you can. You, you can certainly do that. You, you can be here tonight, and you cannot know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You, you cannot be uh, a, a believer, or you might, might be here tonight, and you might, uh, you might take the, 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 the wafer, and you might take the juice in just a moment, and, and, yet, and yet your life, your life is not at all in communion with the Lord Jesus Christ and in communion with the ways that are prescribed in his word. You may, can I say this, you may successfully fool me. And you may successfully fool those around you, but God knows. And God judges those who come to this supper unworthily. According to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verses 28 to 30. And tonight I want us to consider the Passover found in Exodus 12. And I want us to discover that who God was all the way back in Exodus 12. He's, he's the same thing on March the 27th, 2024, nothing has changed. Our God is the same. Number one, I think we discover, as we take a closer look at the Passover, we first of all discover that God is merciful. God is merciful. As we look at the Passover, we see God is merciful. And in just a few moments, as we hold these elements in our hand, we too will proclaim that God is merciful merciful. The death angel was coming to Egypt, and no one 
would ever be the same after this dreadful night. By the way, Israel, Israel on this night stood in danger too, right? I, I mean, if Israel did not do, if Israel not do what God told them to do, then they too would be slaughtered. This killing force was not interested in nationality, in financial prosperity. It didn't take into account skin color, language, spoken, or any other metric that we might conceive of. The only thing that mattered on this night was the blood. That's all that mattered. If, he saw, if, the, if this death angel saw the blood on the outside doorpost of the house, then no blood would be shed within the house. If he saw no blood applied on the outside doorpost of the house, then blood would be shed inside the home. Now, God was merciful. You say, well, how is God merciful? He was merciful to warn Israel of this and to give them an opportunity to escape this coming judgment. Some might, some, some might, might, might look at that and say, well, yeah, that, that is true. God did show Israel mercy, but God showed the Egyptians no mercy whatsoever. And I, I just hear tonight say, I beg to differ. I believe that God did show the Egyptians ample mercy and opportunity for them to avoid this judgment. You see, God sent, God sent Moses and Aaron into, into Pharaoh's presence on numerous occasions, beginning in Exodus chapter number five. And, and they stood before Pharaoh and they said, the Lord God of Israel, he said, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. At any point, beginning right here in Exodus chapter 5, and moving, and we don't know how long it was that the plagues were poured out. Was it a period of months? Was it a period of weeks? Or just a, a period of, of days? We don't know all of that. The Bible is not real clear on the, on the timeline per se. But I'm saying at any point from Exodus 5, 1, all the way until you come to the completion of, uh, of, of this night, Egypt, Egypt could have said, yes, we'll let you go. In fact, in fact, if Pharaoh would have been wise, he would have looked at Moses and Aaron that very night that they walked into his presence for the very first time, and he would have said, your God said, let, let your people go. Well, then I don't want to mess with your God. You can go. And he would have, listen, he would have avoided every single plague that was poured out, including, including this one that we read of here tonight. So, so for us to, for us to, to, to say, well, God, God showed all of that kindness and, and, and mercy to Israel, but he didn't show any kindness and mercy to Egypt. No, he did show kindness and mercy to Egypt, but they sinned away their day of mercy and their day of grace and their day of kindness. They, they disregarded God's word and, and, and God's command. And can I just say, listen, the same thing is true today. God has, made, God has made salvation available to every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. And you know as well as I do that some have never heard, and we speak this to our shame. On the, on the flip side, some have heard, and they have not repented of their sin, and they have not believed on the Lord, and, and they have not, in, in essence, let themselves go and given themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we speak this to their shame. But it does not change the fact that our God is merciful. God is long-suffering and patient. But his day of judgment and wrath will inevitably come. A man is quick to accuse God on the day of judgment of being unmerciful and being unfair. But the reality is God gives all men everywhere opportunity to repent. The Bible says in Psalm 103 and verse number 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Isn't it amazing that people, people like you and me, and, and, you, and you, if you know yourself, you know me, you know that, that none of us are slow to anger. And yet we can accuse God of being merciful when in reality he is full of mercy. He is, the Bible says he is slow to to anger. The Bible says in Isaiah 55 and verse number seven, let the wicked forsake his way. Hey, Pharaoh, let the people go. And you don't have to worry about 10 plagues, including the death of the firstborn. Just let the people go. Just forsake your wicked way. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
Listen, the Egyptians were a thorn in the side of the Israelites for a lengthy period of time. And yet at any point leading up to what we read here tonight, Pharaoh could have said, if that's what your God wants, then that's what he can have. And yet he chose over and over again to harden his heart and to go his own way. We see not only is God merciful, but we discover as we continue in this text that God is holy. God is holy. Would you look in verse number five? So God instructs them, take a lamb, every one of you. Well, what kind of lamb? Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. They were told to take a lamb, but that, but not just any lamb would suffice. The lamb that they were to remove or separate from their flock for this purpose was to be without blemish. It was to be a male of the first year. That, that idea of the first year just speaks of innocence. It's just, it's just a tiny little thing here. It's, 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 it's pretty pure. It hasn't, it hasn't gotten involved in anything just yet. It's just a male of the first year. It's just figuring things out in life. That's sort of the idea, innocence. This lamb would, was to be without blemish because it was to represent God's son. A lamb with deformities, a lamb with abnormalities, a lamb with blemishes would be an inappropriate image of God's son who is perfect and holy. God is holy, he's righteous, he's perfect and clean. And as men, listen, we are just the opposite. You know, I I think to myself, what an offensive thing, what an offensive thing it is when we as deformed and sinful men try to do something that only God can do. See, only God can erase sin. Only God can pay the penalty for sin. An unholy, imperfect man or woman can never sufficiently deal with their own sin, though they might try to do so. That, see, that which is blemished can never produce that which is unblemished. See, things reproduce after their own kind. And so, and so when you take, a, you take a sinner and that sinner tries to, to pay his sin debt or tries to pay the sin debt of someone else, well, you're, you're, the problem is you're starting from a foundation of sinfulness. And sinfulness can never, can never do away with sin. It, it, requires, it requires that which is perfect and that which is holy. God would never be satisfied. God would never be satisfied with the blood of a lamb that was blemished or the sickliest lamb in their flock. This would never complete the picture of his beloved son who is perfect, holy, and righteous. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Later in that same book, Hebrews 7, 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. You understand why God said, this is the kind of lamb you're to pull out of your flock? You can't, you can't pull out a lamb that, you know, that, that has a broken leg. You can't pull out a lamb that's missing an eye. You can't, you know, that you have, you have no use for that lamb. That's the one we'll sacrifice. God, God says, that won't complete the picture because what I'm going to send is going to be perfect. It's going to be undefiled. It's going to be blameless and holy. It is going to be that which is higher than the heavens. The least you can do is give me the best lamb that you have. That alone will complete the picture. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 5, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Thirdly and finally tonight, we learn not only as we gaze at the Passover that God is merciful, we discover that God is holy, but there's a third thought that I find in this text, and that is this, that God is pleased with faith and obedience. God is pleased with faith and and obedience. We know from Scripture that two things please and satisfy God. If we come to Him in any other way than, than this, then we will fail. We will fall flat on our face. What, what is the first thing that pleases God? Number one is faith. Faith pleases God. In verse number 11, God instructed, I, I, I love this, this just jumps off the page at me. He says, And thus shall ye eat it 
with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. So, so God instructed, listen, on that night, on that, on that 14th day of the month, you've killed the lamb, you've shed its blood, you've applied the blood to the outside doorpost of the home and to the top of the doorpost, and now you're, now you're sitting in the home, you've roasted it with fire, you can't cook it any other way, and now you're gonna sit and you're gonna eat this, but, but you're, not just gonna, you're not gonna eat it in your, in your bed clothes, you're, you're not gonna eat it in your, in, in your work clothes, no, you're gonna eat it in your traveling clothes. Now why do you suppose, why do you suppose God wanted them with their shoes on and, with, and, and being fully dressed. And why do you suppose that he wanted with a fork in one hand and a walking stick in the other? You know, you know what that is? That's a picture of faith. That is them sitting down saying, we're eating this meal and we're not gonna be here very long. The for sale sign is for sale in the house outside because we're marching out of here tonight. Now, now, now think about it, God had not, God had not instructed them to, to dress like this during any of the other plagues, but God was saying, you, you follow my directions here, and you're walking out of Egypt tonight, and, and all you have to do is you just have to put your faith in me, and here's, remember, remember we said God, God loves these visible pictures of, of faith, God says, you believe me, okay, then do this, put your shoes on, put, put, your, put, put your traveling clothes on. And get that walking stick in your hand and make sure your bags are packed and you eat that thing in a hurry because you're gonna walk out of there that same night. You know what that is? That's faith. You know, if they would have sat down to eat that meal, the house is still disorderly and, 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 and they're, in their, they're in their pajamas ready to you know, close things up for the night. We're gonna eat this meal and then we're gonna hop into our beds. What kind of faith is that? It's not faith at all. God said, you believe me, don't you? This, this night, <laughs> it's gonna be like any, unlike any other night. This night, as you follow my directions, we're leaving this place and we're moving forward. They were, there's another, there's another step of faith that they were, that they were to, to do as they, as they ate this meal. And, and you, might, you might miss it, I almost missed it, to be very frank. But God not only instructed them to eat with their traveling clothes on, but he also told them to eat all of it and not to save any of it for the morning. Did you ever, did you ever notice that? You ever wonder why, you know, God, God is a God of order, isn't he? Right? So, so God doesn't do anything by accident. We, we, might, we might, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll tell my kids to do something and they'll look at me and they'll say, why? And I'll be like, I don't know. I, re I really don't have a good reason. It just sounded good in the moment, I guess. God, God doesn't handle things like that. God, God always has a purpose. He always has a reason why he wants you to do things. So, so every, every word in this book, there's a reason why it's there. And, and, and so we, we sometimes, and I do this, I know I do it, I read, I read a few chapters in the morning, and sometimes I'm just in a hurry to check it off my list, and, and I, I think, man, God help me to slow down because there are some incredible things in this book. You know what he, you know what he was telling them in, in verse number 10? He, he's saying, he's saying, He's saying, you, you don't, you're not saving anything for tomorrow. You say, well, what's, what's that a picture of? Well, it was, it was intended that they leave Egypt and march into the promised land fairly quickly. And you know and I know that it, it lasted 40 years of wandering, and we know why. We understand, most of us would understand the, the, the thought behind all of that. But can I just say that on this journey from Egypt to Canaan, they were going to have to trust God every single day, every day. He would, he, he, he's, saying, he's saying, listen, listen, I, I, I am taking it upon me to provide for you every single day. Therefore, therefore, don't leave anything till the morning. No, no leftovers, no reserves. You know, we're, we're, we're going to put this, you know, we, we do this in our house. I'm sure you do it yours. We don't eat all the meal. We're going to put it away and we're going to eat it later. God says, that's not what you're going to do. You're gonna, you're gonna eat the meal, and then you're gonna walk away from it. You're gonna eat, either eat all of it or you're gonna burn it up because by the next day it won't be good anymore. Why? Because this is all a picture. You are to trust me every single moment on this journey. It's faith. It's faith. And so God told, God told his people, eat all of it. Don't, don't let any of it, don't let any of it wait until the morning. Now, now we, see, we see that when the manna came, they, they, they tried to pull this trick, didn't they? Some of them, some of them, they were coming into the Sabbath day and, and, they, and they thought, well, we're not allowed to gather anything tomorrow, so let's gather extra tonight. 
God, God told them, don't do that. But they did it. The next day, God was upset. He was angry. He said, how much longer am I going to put up with these people? They just need to trust me. That, that what I'm going to give them is going to last. That it's going to, it's going to take care. I know, I know what I'm doing. Doesn't God know what he's doing? And so God is telling them, listen, have faith in me. Eat with your, eat with your traveling clothes on. Eat with the bag, bags packed. Eat with the walking stick in your hand. Eat with the for sale sign in the front yard. And eat all of it. Don't save anything for tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day and I'll provide another meal for you tomorrow. Don't you worry about it. God, listen, God is pleased with faith. Now listen, what we believe in our hearts, what we believe in here, will be seen outwardly in the way that we live. In other, words, in other words, if you're really a man of faith, you're a woman of faith, you don't, you, you don't have to tell anybody, they're gonna see it. They're gonna know it. They're gonna know in the way that you live. They're gonna know in the way that you treat your family. They're gonna know it in the way that you uh, serve God. And they're gonna know it in the way that you participate and serve in your, in your church. There, there's, there's not gonna be any, any, anything in, in us that we're holding back from God. If it's, if it's the next step I need to take is baptism, then so be it. If the next step I need to take is, is surrendering my life to the Lord, then so be it. I'm willing to do it. If God wants me to teach it, I'll do whatever God wants me to do. That's the way people of faith live. Day by day, just following the Lord. Not holding anything back. Why? Because that's what pleases God. God demanded a measure of faith then, and he still demands faith today. The way to God is by faith. Hebrews 3 and verse number 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Second thing that we find God is pleased with, both on the night of the Passover and, and in our lives still today, God is pleased with obedience. Verse 13, he says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when, when I see, when I see the, your, your good works, when, 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 I, when, I see, when I see you giving lots of money away, I'll pass over you. No, that's not what he says. When, when, I, when I see you get into the baptistry waters, that, then I'll pass over you. That's not what he says. He says, when I see the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now listen, I'm sure there were some who heard these words and thought, now this is a very strange and even somewhat morbid request coming from God. You want us to do what? Kill, a, kill an innocent lamb? The best lamb that we have for, 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 for just, just for us to eat a meal on that night? And, for, and, you, and then you want us to take his blood and you want us to spread it on the doorposts of our home? What will the Egyptians think? You know, what, what, will, what will our neighbors say about this? I'm sure there were some that raised their eyebrows. Don't you suppose when Moses said, no, here's what we're gonna do. Gather around. God, God's instructed us in some way. Moses, Moses, we've, we've, seen, we've seen some unusual things, but this, this one might take the cake. You, you, God, God, are you sure, are you sure God, wants, God wants us to do this? This is exactly what God wants us to do. At that point, at that moment, they have a decision to make. Am I gonna be obedient? Am I gonna do what God requires, or am I going to do my own thing? God wants them to kill their best lamb and apply its blood to the doorpost and eat all of it dressed in traveling clothes and not save any of it till the morning. They may not have understood it in that moment, but they, listen, they were not, they were not responsible to understand it all. They were simply responsible to obey it all. They didn't have to have all the answers, and neither do I. Neither do we, church family. I don't, I don't, have, to know, I don't have to know what God is doing in every moment. I don't, know if, I don't have to know what he's doing every moment of my life, but I do have to, I do have to figure out what, is he, what does he say to me in this book and I gotta do it. I gotta obey him. Many times we refuse to do what God has instructed us to do because to us it doesn't make sense or we can't figure it out. Listen, God is looking for obedience. When I see the blood, not, not when I see you've got it all figured out, you have all the answers. No, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. In other words, he said, when I, when I see that you've done what I've instructed you to do, I will bypass your home for death and destruction. You know, God delights 
still today in obedience. Samuel said to Saul, half the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices is in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Jeremiah 7, 23, but this thing commanded I them, saying, obey my voice and I will be your God and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I've commanded you that it may be well unto you. As we conclude this message tonight, let's turn our attention back to this table that we see in front of us. Understand that, listen, God designed it for us as a memorial. Just as he designed the Passover feast for the Old Testament saints as a memorial. Here's, here's the point. The Passover feast that we just read about, that table looks ahead. It looks ahead. This table tonight that we're going to observe, it looks back. And let me just, let me just conclude by saying this. Jesus Christ is the center of both tables. He's the center. He's, he's the lamb. He's the lamb that was slain. That's that, 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 that blood, that's his blood. That's his blood that's on the doorpost. That's what it's picturing. It's, it's picturing the blood of Christ. That, 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 that lamb that was without blemish, that's him. He is holy and without blemish. And, and listen, church family, as we come tonight and we pass these elements by, you, you'll take, you'll take some, some bread that is unleavened. The reason, listen, not just any bread will do tonight because of what it pictures. We, 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 we could play some games with this if we wanted to. It'd be a dangerous game to play. But we could, we could just serve you normal bread like, like, like you'd get out in a store. But it would never picture Jesus Christ, and he's the center of this table. And you're going you're gonna to receive some, some, some fruit of the vine, which, by the way, is, is, uh, is, is, not, is not alcoholic. There's no, there, there, there's no leaven in the bread. There's no alcohol in the in, in, in the the fruit of the vine that you're going to drink? Why? Because Jesus Christ is pure. He is not tainted. He is perfect. He is holy. And he is unblemished. Therefore, therefore, it would not be right for us to serve anything other than these that we've been instructed to do. The table we come to tonight still communicates what the table in Exodus 12 communicated. So in just a moment, as you take that bread and you take that cup, I want you to be reminded, God is merciful. God is merciful. He's made a way. He's made a way for me to bypass death and destruction. The death angel, church family, the death angel is still coming, but he's not coming to my house. He's not coming to my house, not because I'm, I'm good, I'm holy, I'm righteous. He's not coming to my house because the blood has been applied. He's merciful. And as you, as you, take, that, you take that wafer and you put it in your mouth and it tastes different, may you be reminded God is holy. God is holy. He's unblemished, he's different, he's separated, he's set apart from the rest of the world. And as you gaze upon this table and as you think about your participation in it, may you be reminded, listen, that God is pleased with faith and obedience. Therefore, those of us who participate in the table, if we're going to do so worthily, we certainly understand we, we never do so worthily in our, own, in our own strength and our own ability, we do so worthily because of Christ, but if you're gonna participate in this table worthily tonight, listen, listen, it's because you have placed, number one, you have placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a believer. You know that, you know that heaven is your eternal home. You know that the Holy Spirit of God dwells inside of you. You know the blood has been applied. And, and, you are also saying, you are also saying, as you take this, as you take this, this bread and this cup into your body, you are saying, as far as I know, I'm living in complete obedience to him. That's, that's what it's all about. That, that's what the Passover was about. That's what the Lord's Supper table is about. That's what, it, that's what it's for, to, for us tonight. Let's, let's, let's think on these things. Our God is merciful. Our God is holy. And our God is pleased with faith and obedience. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed for just a moment. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, you've heard, you've heard the message tonight. And so I just feel led to give you an opportunity there in the quietness of your seat to consider your participation in this supper. You say, well, I'm here tonight. I don't have to take it. No, nobody has to take it. In fact, in fact you've already seen the text. You, you, you should be warned that if, if your life isn't what it should be, then you should not participate and you should not take it. And so would you pause for just a moment. Is there someone here tonight that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior? That's the starting point. 
salvation, the new birth? Have you been born again, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you been born again? If you've never been born again, tonight could be the greatest night of your life. What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer asked in Philippians, or excuse me, in Acts chapter 16. The Apostle Paul cried out in the night, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ means to acknowledge that you are a sinner. It means to acknowledge that Jesus Christ came, the sinless son of God, and he completely and totally paid your sin debt. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ means to place all of your faith and all of your trust in him and to acknowledge that what he did for you on the cross is sufficient to pay for all of your sin and to give you a clean and fresh and brand new heart that's created by God. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I invite you even right now? Would you call upon the name of the Lord? Would you? So what does that mean? It just simply means crying out to him, acknowledging the things that we've talked about. I'm a sinner, Lord. My sin would send me to hell, and I don't want to go there. I want to bypass the, the death and the destruction of the death angel. And so would you forgive me of all of my sins? Would you come into my heart and make me clean? I believe that what you did for me on the cross is sufficient to wash away every sin. And then I want to say this to those of you that are here tonight that are saved. You're a believer. You say, well, I'm saved. That's enough to for me to take this supper, it's not enough. Apostle Paul was pretty clear to the church at Corinth. He says, some of you have taken this unworthily. You've not judged yourself. And as a result, some of you are sick. He said, some, some of you even sleep. God, God, God killed some people in the church at Corinth because of their haphazard, casual, careless way of participating and approaching the Lord's Supper. And so we're not playing games here tonight. This is serious business, so take a moment, would you? Take a moment and reflect pianist is going to come to the platform and play a very special song, a song that is very fitting as it relates to this time of year. The title of the song is the Via Della Rosa. It's the way of suffering. And so as she plays that softly, I want you to just kind of stay in a spirit of reflection if you would. And I'm going to also invite our church leadership, if they would, to make their way to here the front to help us prepare to distribute these elements.